What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Bush coming at you with a 10-team PPR mock draft. I'm going to be using the Sleeper app today with our fellow Discord members. If you guys want a chance to be in mock drafts like this, you can join the Discord below. Like, comment, subscribe if you enjoy. Now let's get into the mock draft. Okay, so we are in the mock draft. I'm going to randomize the order real quick. Like I said, if you guys want a chance to be in mock drafts like this, you guys can join the Discord in the description below. It's totally free to do so. Randomizing the order, and it looks like I have the seventh overall pick. So this is a 10-team mock draft, and me and Danny have kind of slacked on this a little bit, so I apologize for you guys that are in 10-team leagues, but uh, we don't do a lot of 10-team mock drafts. So I'm going to give my kind of breakdown of my strategy in this kind of league and uh, what I'm looking to do at the seventh pick. So if you guys have a late pick in your 10-team drafts, this should be a, a good video for you guys. As we can see off the board at the beginning of the draft, we have Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, Dalvin Cook, and Derrick Henry. And uh, in terms of roster settings in this league, it is a one quarterback league, two running backs, three wide receivers, a tight end, and two flex spots with six benches. So relatively deep starting rosters for a redraft league. Looks like we're going pretty chalky, at least to begin the draft with all these running backs going off the board. I'd imagine those are kind of the uh, the directions most people are going to be going. So I'm on the clock here, and it uh, looks like I got a number of different choices. In a 10-team league, I'm more likely to take a player like Travis Kelsey because he has a big-time positional advantage. But uh, for me, I'm not going to pass on a guy like Saquon Barkley. Again, if you guys are new to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. I know uh, mock drafts tend to bring in a lot of new viewers, but... My stance on Saquon Barkley, and we talked about this with Dr. Edwin Porras of FantasyPoints.com. Basically, Saquon Barkley is the type of running back that has that legendary upside that you look for in your fantasy draft. And I'm always looking for that upside. Saquon Barkley, as it stands right now, has a murky situation when it, uh, in terms of his overall health, in terms of his workload to begin the season. But I'm going to trust the ability of the player, the 10 and a half month timeline that he's had to recover from this injury. Even if he doesn't play in the preseason, if we hear more positive reports about him being ready to go at the beginning of the season, I'm willing to take that risk on him at the back end of the first round and take him as my number one running back because I, I I simply think he's worth that pick and I simply think he has that kind of ceiling and he's also very safe. When he's on the field, he gets every amount of volume you could ask for. He's a big play threat, play in and play out and his offensive situation is actually the best it's really been in the past couple of years of his career. So at the end of the first round, we saw Jonathan Taylor, Travis Kelsey, Nick Chubb and some other running backs go off the board. For me on the board right now, I think I'm actually going to take Tyreek Hill. I'm taking Tyreek Hill here because, because it's a 10-team league, I'm more willing to shy away from running back, running back at the beginning of drafts because generally speaking, you can get better running backs in round three. But uh, Tyreek Hill to me is a bit of a tear break at the wide receiver position. Uh, when you look at him versus Adams, the case obviously in a PPR league, I would take Devontae Adams. You can make the case for Stephon Diggs over Tyreek Hill as well in a PPR league, but Tyreek Hill, his ceiling on a weekly basis is just so high with Patrick Mahomes and with his big playability. So to pair him and Saquon Barkley together, I, I arguably am getting the two most talented players at their position. Um, and that's always something you you really want to bargain with on uh, in fantasy drafts. So looking over everybody else's team, we can see that a couple people are adopting that running back, running back strategy. Obviously, you can see tried takes Jonathan Taylor and Joe Mixon, definitely a fine strategy there, although I think that is a little early on Joe Mixon. Nick Chubb and Aaron Jones at the turn for Sandman, another uh, a good pairing there. You got uh, Savo going with Zeke Elliott and Najee Harris, probably two guys that are going to, I would say, probably lead the NFL in total touches. So great strategy for him there. And then we see a lot of these wide receivers sliding or coming off the board now. Derrick Henry and Stephon Diggs, great strategy to start the draft there. Dalvin Cook and Calvin Ridley again. In a PPR league, Calvin Ridley is going to be an absolute phenomenal pick. Uh, I really like that pick for him. To me, uh, for core going Clyde edwards helaire I just personally, I can't draft Clyde edwards helaire that early. He needs to be in a 10-team format. He needs to be a guy that I get in the mid to late third round for me to even consider him because I, I would take a number of guys ahead of him. Um, we're, we're starting to see a lot of these wide receivers slide off the board, and it is a three wide receiver start format. So wide receivers are going to be a little bit more valuable in this position because it is PPR, because it is three wide receivers. Uh, it is a little bit more important, but because it is a 10 team league, you could pretty much find wide receivers anywhere. So I don't fault people for going running back early from that perspective. So we see George Kittle, who is the second of the top three guys to go off. 
the board. Um, later, uh, earlier yesterday, we talked about our tight end rankings. So if you guys want to go over that, we went through our final tight end rankings for August. If you guys are curious about which tight ends you should be targeting, we also discussed when you should be targeting them, not just like who the player is and what their outlook is this year. And we see Darren Waller, who I was hoping would fall to me, uh, go off the board at the three five there. I was definitely hoping I could get him. Uh, right now, as the board currently stands, I'm really eyeing a guy like DeAndre Swift. Uh, in a PPR format, I think he's, ah, that's terrible. I knew that was going to happen. So DeAndre Swift goes off the board. So for me, I'm not willing to take a guy like J.K. Dobbins here in a PPR format. I think he's a guy I need to get towards the end of the third, early fourth round. So I'm actually going to go with Keenan Allen, who in a PPR league, like I said, is going to have all the upside in the world to really return value on um, on the pick that you're spending on him because we saw this guy legitimately get double digit targets in pretty much every game that he played with Justin Herbert last year. The only games he didn't, he actually just left early in the game or was limited. And it was announced pregame that he would be limited in the game. So in Keenan Allen, you're getting a guy that can legitimately lead the NFL in targets. And in any kind of PPR format, that's going to be very high value, obviously. And coming from a, a quarterback like Justin Herbert, they were going to be high volume or high value targets anyway. So we see, um, Perkins goes with J.K. Dobbins there to close out his running back, uh, uh, double running back in the uh, second and third round strategy. We also see a number of wide receivers come off the board. Sandman gets Allen Robinson as his wide receiver one. Again, in a PPR format, definitely can't fault you for the Allen Robinson pick there. Um, overall, I think this board has gone pretty uh, chalky overall. I haven't seen any you know outlandish reaches or anything. David Montgomery, again, a guy I was really hoping would fall to me in the next round, as was a guy in C.D. Lamb that I wanted to fall to me. So. At running back, I'm really, uh, I'm really not liking my options on the board right now. I think David Montgomery was the last of the uh, tier of running backs that I was looking to get. So now with him off the board, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to reach on a guy like Josh Jacobs. Unfortunately, tried, did just reach on a guy like Josh Jacobs. So when I look at the board right now, I, I'm really caught between a couple guys. I really like Julio Jones here. I really like um, Chris Godwin here, and uh, quarterback wise, I mean. Patrick Mahomes is on the board and I have Tyree kill. So it is definitely a, con a, a thing I'm considering, but I, I think I'm actually going to go towards uh, Mike Evans. And in a PPR format, Mike Evans takes a little bit of a hit because he is going to be more of a big play guy versus a volume guy. But the fact that I'm going to get those big plays out of Mike Evans, the fact that I'm going to get those touchdowns out of Mike Evans is still a big deal to me. So I'm going to go with a guy in Mike Evans, who's my third wide receiver. I don't really need to rely on him when I have uh, stalwarts like Tyree Kill and Keenan Allen to to really anchor my wide receiver core. So a guy in Mike Evans is my third wide receiver is going to provide me with a lot of weekly ceiling. I've already talked about this Buccaneers offense at nauseum, basically, because they are going to produce probably the highest points output in the NFL this year. And you want pieces of that situation, right? You want pieces of Chris Godwin and Mike Evans and Antonio Brown, and Rob Gronkowski, because Tom Brady is going to sling the ball all over the field. We saw him throw 40 touchdowns in his first year in Bruce Arian's system last year. And I think that can only go up from an efficiency perspective that this offense should only get better. Given the fact that they brought everybody back, the continuity of the offense is definitely still in great shape. Um, overall, we do see Patrick Mahomes as the first quarterback off the board in the four, eight in general, I would say when you look at 10 team drafts in general, I would say that uh, I'm more likely to take a quarterback early because especially at the top, when we look at the uh, quarterback position, guys like Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, these guys are, are extremely high ceiling quarterbacks. When I say high ceiling, I don't mean relative to other quarterbacks. I don't mean they can finish as the quarterback one because that should be a given. When I say high ceiling, I mean Kyler Murray, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott. These guys have a chance to be 25 point per game scorers, which is going to be historically a huge advantage at the position. We saw a guy in Kyler Murray last year before he went down with injury, be a guy that was putting up 25 plus points per game. We saw Dak Prescott, given the the volume and the efficiency of that offense, put up a high number of points when he was on the field last year. Lamar Jackson, of course, with his legs is going to be able to put up huge numbers. And same goes for Josh Allen with a mix of his elite passing and his legs as well. So they're guys I'm definitely going to be targeting if I can get them after this pick in the, in the sixth round, if any of those guys fall to me, I'm definitely going to be pulling the trigger. Um, overall, when I look at the board right now, I really like the upside of a guy in Jamar chase, who's going to be my fourth receiver. He's not a guy I need to rely on, but, uh, my currently my highest ranked wide receiver is Brandon. Ayuk. When I look over at running back, I, I really like, uh, Travis Etienne here. And Travis Etienne is a guy that I'm really starting to warm up to. And again, this is a PPR format. So 
Travis Etienne is a guy that is going to get relatively all of the receiving work out of that backfield because they've already kind of come out and said, this is a guy that is a receiving back. He can do it all basically in the passing game. And we saw last year, Travis Etienne lead all NCAA running backs in receptions. So this is a guy that's very capable in the passing game. Might take a little bit of time to get acclimated to the NFL. So James Robinson might be a little bit of a thorn in my side uh, at the beginning of the season if I were to roll with this team. But I'm going to basically make up for it a bit later when I uh, fill out my running back depth to make sure that I can get by in case Travis Etienne isn't a guy that I can rely on right away. And I was hoping Brandon Ayuk would fall to me. Obviously, that is not the case. So I'm going to be targeting one of these quarterbacks, hopefully, on the way back. Hopefully, a Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, or Dak Prescott can fall to me with my next pick because I'm definitely looking to secure one of those guys. Overall, when I look at my team, I really uh, I really like what I've built in terms of a ceiling. I have uh, very high upside players. Obviously, as a first-round running back, Travis Etienne definitely has a very high ceiling. People don't really want to admit the fact that James Robinson wasn't the pick of this coaching staff, right? They didn't actually select James Robinson. They didn't find him in undrafted free agency. They came in and they decided that they needed more speed in their backfield. And they went with a guy in Travis Etienne. So would it shock me if James Robinson kind of fades into oblivion, fades into Latavius Murray, Alexander Madison status in terms of a volume share? It wouldn't shock me at all because I think that's exactly what Urban Meyer has in store for him. And I think Etienne is going to be a lot more involved than people think. So when I look at the quarterback position, a guy in uh, Josh Allen fell to me which I'm very shocked happened. So I'm going to go with him because in a 10 team league, you got to remember that everybody's team is going to be good, right? When you look at all these teams, if you look over each one, Zeke Elliott, Najee Harris, Darren Waller, Amari Cooper, Robert Woods, these are all great players. So when you can spot positional advantages like tight end and like quarterback, you need to take advantage of them. To me, Josh Allen and Dak Prescott were the last of these elite quarterbacks that have these potential for elite seasons, not only to finish as quarterback one, but potential to be true difference makers at the position. So I'm going to go with Josh Allen and uh, basically lock up my quarterback situation in this 10 team format. You can see that a number of other uh, teams in this league also went quarterback with Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson going off the board. I really like what Sandman did stacking uh, Andrews and Lamar Jackson at the end of the fifth, sixth round. I think that was a tremendous pick by him because uh, now he has that basically he has that passing offense on lock. And unfortunately for me as a big time Rashad Bateman truther, uh, Rashad Bateman's dealing with some injuries right now, and that's definitely going to affect Mark Andrews in a positive way because he he was really the only target competition I, I would have for a guy like Mark Andrews. So um, overall, we could see the wide receivers are still uh, plentiful on the board, really. If you go to the wide receiver position, you can still see we have some great options on the board here. And uh, a lot of teams haven't maybe net yet realized that this is a three wide receiver start. So you do need a fair amount of wide receiver depth. And I would say you also need a fair amount of wide receiver um, elite players because in a PPR format, your wide receivers are going to carry you a little bit more than they would in a half PPR two wide receiver start. So I really like what I did going wide receiver early. Unfortunately, I would have, I, I wish I could have gotten another running back somewhere in there, but the value to me just wasn't there. And as we talked about yesterday, the biggest mistake that you can really make in fantasy drafts is overvaluing certain positions uh, like running back, right? Because yeah, Antonio Gibson, Tyreek Hill are probably in the same tier, but in a PPR format, in a, uh, a format where you got to start three wide receivers, I would give give the, the edge to Tyreek Hill there because he is a true difference maker at the position where Antonio Gibson definitely could be a true difference maker at the running back position. But in a PPR format, we don't know what his uh, his passing upside is. Yes, he was a wide receiver in college, but we can't give that too much credence, right? We can't just be like, well, because he was a wide receiver in college, he's now automatically going to be some elite pass catching running back. We don't know that for sure. JD McKissick is still there. And even though I believe in Antonio Gibson, I can't pass on a, a sure thing like Tyree kill for a guy like Antonio Gibson. So had Tyree kill been gone, I probably would have went with Antonio Gibson or Najee Harris there, but because he was not gone, I went with uh, Tyree kill. So as we can see, uh, Michael Thomas goes at the six ten, and in my opinion, in Edwin Porras, who is our uh, doctor aficionado uh, that we had on our channel, he said, don't spend a draft pick on Michael Thomas. And I agree with him because this is a guy that even if he comes back in October, we have disgruntled, you know, attitudes with the team. This is a guy that is not necessarily getting along with his, his teammates. He got in a fight last year with Char Chauncey Gardner Johnson. This is also a guy from a medical perspective that could deal with some injuries as a result of the surgery that he had. And best case scenario, we always project the best case scenario while we're in drafts, right? I'm sure the guy that just took Michael Thomas was like, well, he might only be out for a couple of weeks. But the problem with that line of thinking is what if he's not, 
right? Then you just drafted him at his ceiling. And that's something that you don't usually want to be doing. So when I look overall on the board, I was really eyeing a guy like TJ Hawkinson. Obviously he didn't fall to me. So I'm going to go for a, a big time upside swing in Chase Claypool. You guys know how high I am on Chase Claypool as a player. I think he has DK Metcalf like potential. I really like the value of getting him here at the seven, seven, really uh, as a guy that I don't have to really rely on. He's a flex position for me. I don't have to put him in my, one of my top three wide receiver spots. So I really like getting Chase Claypool as my fourth wide receiver there. And at running back, I'm, I'm looking a little bit shaky right now, obviously with ETN and Barkley as my top two guys. So I'm really, really hoping a guy like Mike Davis can fall to me because at the very least, I know Mike Davis is really guaranteed a workload, which is not something I can say about Travis Etienne. So hopefully Mike Davis can fall to me, but I have a feeling he's going to go before I can pick. So we'll just have to see what happens here. And um, yeah, there he goes right off the board, right on cue. I completely jinxed it. So uh, Mike Davis is off the board and uh, that really puts me in a bit of a bind in terms of the running back position. So I actually, um, I really like Trey Sermon and Michael Carter at this point in the draft. So I'm probably going to lean towards one of those running backs, even though I, I do like a lot of the wide receivers still on the board. I'm pretty strong at that position. Of course, I don't have to worry about quarterback at all because I have Josh Allen. So hopefully uh, Michael Carter can fall to me because I actually do favor Michael Carter to Trey Sermon because he has less competition in his backfield for touches. It's also a coaching staff that we don't really know what their tendency is in terms of how they're going to use running backs. We know they come from the San Francisco tree, but we don't necessarily know that they're going to deploy their running backs the same way that Kyle Shanahan deploys his running backs. So I'm going to go with Michael Carter here. Again, I'm, I'm shooting for the upside, obviously, with these two running backs, both being rookie running backs. Uh, we, we're, we get a bit of that unknown factor. But the one thing we do know about Michael Carter is that he's the most talented running back in his backfield. He's also the best pass catcher in his backfield. And given that this is a PPR league, I'll, I'll take the fact that even if Michael Carter isn't completely a workhorse running back or anything, I do expect him to be the primary passing down running back for this offense. So uh, he's a guy that I can really trust to get, you know, 30, 40, 50 receptions as a rookie. And I think that can help me uh, help me fill out my running back core a little bit better than what I currently had. So hopefully Trey Sermon can actually fall to me in the next round. And, oh, and there goes Trey Sermon. So hopefully Trey Sermon could have fallen to me. Obviously he did not. I was hoping to just stack up all these rookie running backs and and uh, have a great situation to go through um, going forward. But uh, as it stands right now, I'm not a big fan of the running backs on the board. Damian Harris is the next guy that I'm leaning towards with my next pick. But unfortunately for Damian Harris, he is more of a, uh, a two down running back. He doesn't get a lot of involvement in the receiving game and in a PPR format that definitely hurts me a little bit. But if he does fall to me, I will select him because what he effectively does is mitigate the risk that I took with my Travis Etienne pick because with Damian Harris, we know at least for the beginning of the season, he's going to be the primary starter. We've heard nothing but positive reports relating to his workload uh, from the beginning of this season really on. So Damian Harris, if he can make it to me, will, will really help me mitigate the risk I took with taking two rookie running backs in Travis Etienne and Michael Carter. So hopefully he can get to me with my next pick and also the risk I took with Saquon Barkley as well. So I, I really need a guy in Damian Harris to help me fill out my running back core. We can see in terms of the overall board, we can see a lot of running backs starting to go off the board. Kenny Galladay and DJ Chark and, and a number of other wide receivers are starting to thin out that position. Noah Fant was a guy that I also was eyeing at the tight end position. So I'm probably just going to wait at tight end at this point because I don't really see the value in taking a tight end uh, early at this point because I already really missed on the big positional advantages. Robert Tunyon is actually my next rated tight end, and I have a feeling he's going to go off the board relatively soon. So we'll have to see um, what we're dealing with there. Overall, I would say this draft is not necessarily going the way I planned, and that's okay, right? That's why we do mock drafts. If you guys are, for, are new to fantasy, maybe you're just checking out fantasy football YouTube for the first time. I really encourage you to go uh, ahead and do mock drafts on Sleeper. I encourage you to sign up on our on Underdog. Uh, underdogfantasy.com is a great place to practice mock drafts. And I have compared doing underdog drafts basically to the analogy of sparring with, uh, with Muhammad Ali before a boxing match. You're going to be very, very well prepared if you do mock drafts on underdog fantasy because they're not mock drafts, right? They're, they're real money drafts. People have real money on the line. And they help you prepare for your uh, drafts in, in a way that a lot of sites cannot. So I, Damian Harris did fall to me. So I'm going to go with him at the 9-7. I really, really got lucky there, in my opinion. I didn't think he was going to fall to me. So the fact that I secured Damian Harris really makes me feel a lot better about my running back core because it was a very big weak point on my roster. So the fact that I can secure him is definitely helpful. So 
back to underdog. If you guys do want to practice uh, mock drafts on underdog and do best ball drafts, the puppy two um, contest, which you can win a hundred thousand dollars from is closing soon. So you can sign up on underdog using promo code FSE and you can get both of our draft guides totally for free just for using our, our promo code FSE to sign up on underdog and deposit $10. So you'll get 25 bucks also on top of that to draft with, and you'll also get uh, good practice in for your home league. So enough of that, enough of the shameless plug. You can see the, uh, the running backs flying off the board fast and furious right now. A lot of people, much like what I did are kind of probably panicking at the running back position and, uh, grabbing all these running backs before they slide off the board. So I'm hoping I can get Robert Tunyon with my next pick because he is the last of the tight ends that I really feel comfortable with in this range. And he, uh, you can see Aaron Rodgers goes off the board. Um, that's, that's pretty good value for Aaron Rodgers. I would say when you get him that much further down the board than a guy like Russell Wilson and Justin Herbert, I don't think there's much of a difference between those quarterbacks. And I actually prefer Rodgers to Russell Wilson. So great value for uh, SD Perkins there. Um, when you're looking at 10 team leagues, sometimes waiting on quarterback is still the move. But I, like I said, I really like to get an early quarterback in 10 team formats because it gives you a big time advantage at the position. And like I said, Robert Tunyon to me was a tear break at the tight end position. So that is why I went with him there. And at wide receiver, because I have such strong wide receivers at the top, I can really shoot for upside, right? I can really go for some of these rookie wide receivers like Jalen Waddle and Rashad Bateman and Elijah Moore. I can go for guys like that because I know that Tyree Kill and Keenan Allen and Mike Evans are really going to be stalwarts for me in my lineup. I don't need to grab uh, low upside options like a Tyler Boyd here or like a Corey Davis, for example, because while those guys are going to be fine, I'm sure they're going to be okay. The only way I would go with players like that is if I needed more stability in my wide receiver core, which is not the case with my team because I have a lot of high end guys. I'm looking for ceiling. I'm looking for guys that can eventually work their way into uh, my flex spots. And if you look at my starting lineup right now, I have um, some weaknesses there. So if I can get um, a number of these rookie wide receivers or a number of these high upside second year wide receivers, I can uh, really fill out my flex spot to a higher degree than it's currently being filled out. So overall, when I look at my starting roster, like I said, the second running back position is definitely my biggest weakness, but I'm hoping I'm taking a big bet on Travis Etienne that he can become the guy that I think he can become. He was my running back one coming out of uh, Clemson this year. And like I said, in a PPR format, I think he gets a big time bump as well. So when we look at the running back position, we can see that the uh, board is drying up quite uh, quite quickly, right? We don't really have any running backs worthy of being uh, high picks, in my opinion. And this is what you're going to see, right? If you guys are in a 10-team league, 12-team league, 18-team league, whatever the case is, you're going to see the running back uh, runs continue to happen because running back is a very highly valuable position in fantasy football. So people will take upside swings on players that maybe don't deserve it necessarily. So my advice at this point in the draft, when you're deciding between guys like Kenyon Drake and David Johnson, just pick wide receivers. And unfortunately, it does lend itself to having to take some running backs early because the uh, if you don't, if you're at a point where I'm at in the draft and you don't really have that great of running backs, then I, like I said, I do think it's a disadvantage to take running backs like of this value late in drafts. But I also do like the fact that you can get great wide receivers and fill out your flex positions that way. And you can always make trades, right? A lot of people get themselves backed into a corner thinking that they need to draft running backs and wide receivers fast and furious, and they need to go really running back heavy because they can't go into the season with, you know, Damien Harris as their third running back, like presumably I'm going to be. But the problem is with that strategy is that they leave a lot of value on the table. And right now, if I forced a running back pick, then I'd be losing value in other positions. And to me, the best value on the board to me is Rashad Bateman. So I'm going to take Rashad Bateman. And I know he's dealing with a groin injury right now, but it sounds by all accounts like he's going to be ready to go at some point uh, early in the season. And like I said, I have very good wide receivers, so I can afford to wait on a guy like Rashad Bateman for the ceiling that I think he has. So if I had forced a running back pick where I'm picking right now, then I would have lost out on all that value. And if Rashad Bateman turns into Brandon Ayuk or T Higgins from last year, then I wouldn't be able to trade a guy like Rashad Bateman, right? Because if I don't need Rashad Bateman, let's say all the guys that I have, Tyreek Hill, Keenan Allen, Mike Evans, they're all studs, right? And Chase Claypool is a stud. And some of the running backs that I picked maybe are filling up my flex positions. If I don't need a guy like Rashad Bateman, he turns into a top 20 wide receiver, then I could trade him for a running back, right? I could trade him for a tight end. I could trade him for a quarterback and really take advantage of that value. So like I said, don't worry about filling out your starting positions or what position you're weaker at than others. When you're at this point in the draft, just pick the best players available because in a 10 team league, there's going to be uh, plenty available on the waiver wire. There's going to be plenty available for you to fill out your roster that way. 
So you're best off just taking very high upside options because those high upside options could pay off big for you in the form of a great trade chip or uh, a consistent flex option like uh, Rashad Bateman could turn out for me. So that's basically my advice at this point in the draft. Just pick the best players. Don't worry about position they're they're coming at. And that also applies to the fact that you might want to take a, a second quarterback or a second tight end because uh, those guys could turn into very high value pieces for you as well. So like I said, running back to me is not a very good uh, position at this point in the draft. So I'm probably just going to punt that position for the rest of the draft. Uh, looking at the wide receiver position, there's not a lot of upside guys that I really like at this point, but I do really like Terrace Marshall. We're hearing some great reports out of Carolina camp that he's going to work his way into the slot. He's going to potentially take over for a guy like Curtis Samuel. So I, uh, I'll take the upside swing again on, on a guy like Terrace Marshall. So uh, I really like him at this point in the draft. You can definitely uh, stash him and hold him. Maybe a guy like DJ Moore or Robbie Anderson gets hurt. He sees a big bump in target potential and he could uh, work his way into like a T Higgins type role of last year. So he's a guy that I like taking late in drafts. Overall, we're, we're looking at the quarterback position. We're still seeing some great quarterbacks going off the board. So that's kind of the yin and yang situation that I was talking about earlier, right? The fact that I did take Josh Allen early could backfire, right? If, uh, if you have a guy like Ryan Tannehill off the board in the 12th round, I would much prefer getting Tannehill in the 12th than I would getting Josh Allen in the sixth. So like I said, this is why you do mock drafts, right? I don't typically do a lot of mock drafts on sleeper and I do have a number of leagues that are going to be on sleeper. So the fact that I am, I'm learning the ADP of, of sleeper and I can really understand where I can cheap out on certain positions. Maybe I don't need to take a quarterback early because I know I can get Tom Brady, Ryan Tannehill, Matthew Stafford in the 11th round. Maybe I shift to more of that strategy. But like I said, in a 10 team league, Josh Allen has a far higher ceiling because of his rushing ability than some of those Tom Brady, Tannehill quarterbacks. So uh, the fact that I can, I can get a potential huge advantage there is still worth that early round pick to me, but um, getting that discount on those late round guys definitely does hurt uh, in that, from that perspective. So looking at the board, Again, we're seeing a lot of bad running backs going off the board. My advice, like I said, just don't even bother taking running backs at this point in the draft because Philip Lindsay's and Naeem Hines, Devin Singletary's, what can you really hope for out of these guys? They're probably going to be on the waiver wire two weeks into the season. So if you're really looking for running back depth like that, you can always find it on the waiver wire is my advice. So uh, looking at the, the board, the one running back that I do have my eye on though is Gus Edwards because... We don't really know how the Ravens backfield situation is going to shake out. Maybe this is a guy that has some standalone value. And if not, he's going to have great handcuff value as well, of course, uh, knowing that if anything happens to J.K. Dobbins, this is a guy that's going to see a huge workload. So speaking of handcuffs, we're seeing a couple of them going off the board with Kenyon Drake, uh, the backup to Josh Jacobs and Latavius Murray, the backup to Alvin Kamara. So I'm actually going to take Gus Edwards here because he is the last of the running backs. Him and Tony Pollard really are the last of the running backs that I really like, uh, even drafting period. So uh, I don't mind that. Like I said, the running back core that I built is a little weak uh, for my liking, but I can always make trades. Um, hopefully we we get to see a big uh, season out of Travis Etienne and Michael Carter. That would really go a long way for my running back core, obviously. And then Saquon Barkley being Saquon Barkley will help carry it regardless. So uh, a lot of risk that I took at the running back position. Again, like I said, this is why you do mock drafts, because if you're not comfortable with that kind of risk, maybe in my situation, you went with an Antonio Gibson over Tyreek Hill. Maybe you go with a... David Montgomery or JK Dobbins over a Keenan Allen so that you're not putting yourself behind the eight ball at running back. Like maybe I potentially did in, in some of your opinions. So that's basically what I've kind of looked to do overall at, uh, in all drafts is basically just evaluate your strategy as you go through, make adjustments the next time around so that by the time you get to your home league draft or your work league draft or your, your friends and family draft that you don't make those same mistakes that you made in mock drafts. It's, um, it's why we practice, right? So Looking at the quarterback position, I, I even though I have Josh Allen, I really like the uh, the idea of taking a late round quarterback that has a really high ceiling. So I'm going to wait until the last round to take a guy like Trevor Lawrence or Trey Lance or Justin Fields. Hopefully they make it back to me. Maybe they don't, but that's what I'm probably going to be looking to do in the last round. And uh, overall, looking at the board, I don't really like a lot of the board. So I'm just going to take a swing on Jalen Rager. He's not a guy I really believe in, but with Devontae Smith banged up, there is a chance that he takes a step forward in his career. So I'll take the swing on him, even though he's not a guy I personally believe in very much. Maybe I can get somebody to buy in. Maybe I can use him as a trade chip, right? If uh, if Rashad Bateman looks great in the pre... or Sorry, if Terrace Marshall looks great in the preseason and I want to package a guy like Terrace Marshall and Jalen Rager and get a running back like Leonard Fournette or Ronald Jones or something like that. Maybe I'm able to do something like that. So that's why I took the swing on Jalen Rager there. Of course, Trey Lance does go off the board. He was the guy I was eyeing with my last round pick because I do think he has a very, very high ceiling given the fact that he runs the ball and he has the weapons around him that he does. 
that hurts a little bit, but hopefully I can get a guy like Trevor Lawrence or a guy like Justin Fields towards the end of my draft for that upside swing that I could be looking for. We can see Trevor Lawrence actually goes off the board uh, due to the auto pick. Uh, Deshaun Watson, not a bad upside swing. I don't expect Deshaun Watson to play much this year, though, so I probably wouldn't have made that pick. I'm also I'm also looking at tight end, uh, given the fact that this is a 10-team uh, a, a league, right? So the tight end position, if you can find a difference-making tight end, it is going to make a big-time difference for your weekly output of your team. Obviously, I missed out on the elite tight ends, right? The Darren Wallers, the George Kittles, the Kyle Pitts. So I might be looking to grab another tight end here, uh, but I do have Justin Fields on the board. So I'm actually going to grab Justin Fields because I think Justin Fields, if he gets the starting job, I, I compared him to Cam, uh, to Cam Newton coming out of Ohio State. I think he has that kind of rushing potential. So some of these teams, like let's say Jalen Hurts doesn't necessarily work out. This guy waited on quarterback. So let's say Jalen uh, Jalen Hurts isn't working out. I could take Justin Fields and pair him with a Jalen Rager, a Terrace Marshall, one of these upside wide receivers, and maybe I could get Ronald Jones from him. Maybe I could get Kareem Hunt from him even. So that's, again, the way that you want to be looking at your fantasy draft is that it's not over once you finish the draft, right? All of the in-season management, the picking up of waiver uh, pieces, the trading, it all factors into having a great fantasy season. So the draft is just one aspect of it. It's not over once you draft. I'm not going to draft this team and not make another move the rest of the year and say, if this team wins me the championship, so be it. No, if Travis Etienne comes out and he gets out to a 10 target week one, I might trade him, right? Like I might just go out and be like, I don't necessarily believe this is going to happen every week. Maybe I can flip Travis Etienne for DeAndre Swift or something like that after a bad week one from him. So that's basically the strategy aspect I'm looking for. Uh, real quick, I'll go over my team. At uh, quarterback, I have Josh Allen, Saquon Barkley, Travis Etienne as my uh, backfield, basically, as my starting backfield. Tyreek Hill, Keenan Allen, Mike Evans as my top three receivers. Like I said, those guys are really going to help carry me uh, in this league. Robert Tunyon at tight end, Chase Claypool, Michael Carter, Damian Harris, uh, Rashad Bateman kind of filling out my flex positions. And then on my bench for some upside, I got Terrace Marshall, Gus Edwards, Jalen Rager, and Justin Fields. And I might have went a different re direction than Jalen Rager, but the clock was running out on me, so I kind of just picked him. But either way, when I look at this team, obviously my biggest weakness is my RB2 slot, given the fact that I do have a rookie running back who might not be the full-fledged starter of his backfield. But Travis Etienne really is one of the biggest um, interest points for me in terms of what we're going to see in preseason games. And this is being filmed on Thursday, so I haven't actually seen some of these preseason games that we're going to see later today. But uh, you guys would have seen yesterday um, some preseason games occur. And I think once Jacksonville gets on the field, that's going to be my biggest, biggest point of interest is how they're going to use Travis Etienne and James Robinson. Because I think it has a big time fantasy impact. Because if Travis Etienne is a full-fledged starter, full-fledged workhorse running back, he's going to be a steal in drafts, right? And he's going to be the biggest league winner in fantasy football. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see how they're going to deploy him. And looking over some of these other teams, some of these other teams I actually personally like better than mine. I actually really liked what Savo did with getting Zeke Elliott, Najee Harris, and Darren Waller. I think that's a great start to his draft. Filled it out with some good depth as well. So I really like what he did. I know a lot of you guys like when I uh, I go over the team. So I'm going to do that right now. Uh, Dark Knight, again, great start to his draft. Devontae Adams, Antonio Gibson, DeAndre Swift, and Kyle Pitts. He, he was sniping me left, right, and center. All drafts, so great job to Dark Knight. Uh, tried, I I'm not the biggest fan of what he did given the point format that we're in, because he took a lot of running backs that don't necessarily have high receiving ceilings. So again, if you're in a PPR league, you want to be a little bit more cause, uh, cognizant of that. Um, because I think he, he definitely should have went with a guy like Antonio Gibson, Najee Harris over a guy like Joe Mixon because of that receiving ceiling that those guys see, uh, Sandman again, I really like what he did. Uh, Nick Chubb, Aaron Jones, David Montgomery, great running back core. And then he also got Allen Robinson to anchor his wide receivers. Mark Andrews and Lamar Jackson, he kind of took the polar opposite approach of what I took because he went with an early tight end and he also faded wide receiver. And he got, uh, like I said, these Jarvis Landry, Brandon Cooks, Debo Samuel types, they're great if you have great running backs, great quarterbacks, great tight end, because they can get you by in a PPR format. But in my situation, I had great wide receivers. So there was no point of taking guys like that. So overall, I hope you guys did enjoy that. Like, comment, subscribe if you did. I'm sure this will bring a lot of new viewers. Mock drafts always do. So if you are new to the channel, I encourage you to go check out a lot of our other content. We do a lot of theory-based content. We do rankings. We do a lot of superlatives as well. So if you are new to the channel, make sure you guys go check out everything the Fantasy Stock Exchange has to offer. Peace out, guys, and enjoy your Friday.